During this season of Lent, we are examining the meaning of the sacrament of baptism. For the next few weeks, we'll explore stories from the Gospel of John that are traditionally associated with Lent and with baptism because of how they model the life of discipleship for us. Listen now to the first part of a familiar story from John chapter 4, beginning in verse 5, about how Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tried out, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray with me? God of love, this is your time, and we are your people. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand the word that you have for us today so that we may know you more deeply and be the people you created us to be. Amen. So friends, here we are in the middle of the season of Lent. It's a season that's intended to prepare us for baptism or to help us recommit ourselves to living out the baptism that we have already received in a fuller and more deep way. Lent is, after all, about rediscovering who we are in Christ and reorienting ourselves to Christ's mission, very baptismal subjects. One tradition of the church is to spend a couple of weeks in Lent walking through three particular stories in the Gospel of John, stories that teach us what the life of faith looks like as we encounter Jesus, recognize him as our Lord and Savior, and embrace the new life that he offers us. The first of these stories is one of my favorites in the whole scripture, John 4, the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. Now, I think it's interesting that the first explicit model of discipleship that we encounter in John's gospel is not somebody who's part of Jesus' inner circle of followers. It's not even an educated man like Nicodemus. Rather, it is a woman, a Samaritan woman one of those outsiders that we don't associate with. According to the customs of the day, such a person would have been ignored or avoided because Jews and Samaritans didn't really get along. But Jesus, as was his way, crossed the barriers of custom and division in order to embrace the one that we would consider an outsider. Now, while Jesus is traveling From Judea to Galilee, he chooses to go through Samaria. And along the way, he gets tired because it's the middle of the day, the sun is beating down, he sees a well, and he takes a break. And while he's there, this woman comes out to collect water. Now, it's kind of unusual for her to be coming in the middle of the day to get water. That's usually an early morning routine. But for whatever reason, she's coming to fetch water in the middle of the day, and while she's there, This guy asks her for a drink. But as they strike up a conversation, this man, Jesus, says something rather interesting. He says, woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And in case that's not intriguing enough, Jesus goes on to say that everyone who drinks of this ordinary well water will be thirsty again. 
but those who drink of the water that he will give them will never be thirsty. Now that sounds like a pretty good deal to the woman. Magical water that will keep her from being thirsty or having to do this daily chore? I can't even count how many times I as a kid avoided doing chores. Magical water would be great. But in her response to Jesus, I hear a sort of world weariness, a sense of a deeper thirst that she herself is experiencing. I imagine that she, like us, has at times felt unfulfilled in life or has felt frustrated or tired or just plain worn out. Jesus is asking for a drink, but this woman is thirsty too. Friends, what are we thirsty for? Maybe we're thirsty for acceptance, for love, for success, for belonging, for a sense of purpose. We thirst for big things. And we try to quench those thirsts by turning to the wells of the world. If only I could get that promotion. If only I could fill my time with more meaningful things. Well, I have the love of my family and friends. That's a good thing, right? But friends, these earthly wells, this worldly water, it may seem to satisfy for a while, but it will not last. And we'll find ourselves returning time and again to these false, dry wells. We labor to dig more wells, to find more sources of water and hoard that water for ourselves, but it's no use. We're still thirsty. And many of us are thirsty to the point of spiritual dehydration. But thanks be to God, because Jesus meets us right there at the point of our thirst and initiates an encounter in order to offer us something that will sustain us better than any earthly water can. But Jesus isn't speaking about literal water, is he? He's talking about living water. Now, living water in scripture is typically associated with the presence of God, particularly the transformational and sustaining quality of the divine presence. God is, after all, the source of our life. We need God as surely as our bodies need water. That's why prophets like Isaiah often describe God's restoring work as being like water gushing forth from the wilderness or streams coming up in the desert, like burning sand becoming clear pools of water and the thirsty ground bubbling with springs. The living water is a gift from God that transforms us as surely as the springtime rains transform the desert into a blooming field. That's the kind of difference that the presence of God makes in our lives. We go from having lives that are barren and dry to having lives that are bursting with color. The waters of baptism are a sign of the transformative presence of God in our lives, refreshing us and calling forth new life. But in the Gospel of John, this idea of living water has a particular nuance to it. It's about eternal life. Now, it's tempting to think about, okay, so maybe the living water is like the fountain of youth. I can drink of it, and I'll always be young, have all my hair. That'll be great, right? But that's not the kind of eternal life we're talking about. And I dare say we're not even talking about our real and future hope of life with God. Eternal life in the Gospel of John refers to the condition, the quality of life that we enjoy even now because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Later on, Jesus says to his disciples that this is eternal life, that they may know the only true God, and that they may know Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. That is eternal life, to grow in the knowledge and love of God. The living water, then, is that gift, that eternal life, a life grounded in the love and grace of God and constantly being refreshed by the Holy Spirit. When we receive the living water that Jesus offers to us, it means that we are filled to the point of overflowing with nothing less than the Holy Spirit, which empowers us to continue to grow and experience the love of God. 
as we soak in that living water, it becomes an integral part of our very being. And the more that we drink, the more that living water transforms us into the kind of people God calls us to be. But then Jesus says something interesting about how this living water works. He says the water that he gives will become in us a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Friends, this living water is not a calm, placid lake, but a bubbling, rushing stream that wells up in us and spills out into the world around us. It makes me think about that scene from the movie Pocahontas, which I might have watched this week. Pocahontas is running around, and and her father says, Pocahontas, you need to chill. I want you to be like this river. The river is steady. It is calm. Be like the river. But when Pocahontas sits there, and she's watching what the river does, she realizes the river's not steady at all. It's alive. It's teeming with animals and waterfalls and rapids. This water is dynamic. It's fluid. It rushes past. And friends, I think that's how it is with the living water. That's what it's like to be in connection with the Holy Spirit. When we jump into this river, we become part of the life-giving flow. It's not static, it's dynamic. This living water changes us. Just like water, when it drips on a rock, eventually wears it down and creates interesting formations, we get changed by the Spirit. And then it overflows the banks of our expectations in order to change the whole landscape of the world around us. It might be a little unnerving at first, kind of like when you first jump into the deep end of the pool, but eventually we acclimate to the water. We tune in to what God is up to, and we realize that one sip isn't enough. This well, the well of living water, it will never run dry, and it sustains our souls in a powerful way. But friends, the more that we drink of this living water that Jesus offers us, we also realize that it's not just about what the Holy Spirit's doing in us. You see, the baptized life is all about engaging, engaging with God and engaging with other people. Having taken a sip of the living water, we become connected to the source of life, our very God. Much in the way that this Samaritan woman engages with Jesus in a long and deep conversation. I love that this woman isn't afraid to ask questions. And she, in fact, turns out to have some pretty solid theological skills. But it's her willingness to keep talking to Jesus that changes her. They cover some pretty big stuff, from her uncomfortable personal life to what it means to worship God properly, to the promise of the Messiah. All of this leads up to the revelation of who Jesus truly is. His statement in verse 26, as we keep reading in the story, he says, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. That's a bold proclamation about who he is as the Messiah, as the son of God. As she engages with Jesus, this woman's understanding of who he is and the kind of life he's offering her grows. First, she sees him as just this man asking for a drink, but over time, she sees him as a prophet, even as the Messiah. It's interesting that she doesn't speak again after that revelation, but her actions say more than her words ever could. Later in the story, we hear that the woman leaves her water jar and runs back to the city. She leaves her water jar. The whole point of going to the well in the first place is to fill this jar and take it with her back to town, but she leaves it there after she encounters Jesus. I wonder what water jars we might be carrying. What are those burdens that we insist on lugging around with us? Friends, human beings, we tend to hang on to our own ideas about self-sufficiency. We tend to cling to old wounds, to our ambitions and our expectations, as though they can sustain us. 
But by the grace of God, we realize that what we're really thirsty for is a relationship with God. And we are empowered by the grace of God to set down those things and leave them behind. During this season of Lent, what might we need to relinquish so that we can receive with open hands the good gifts of God? Now notice, the woman, she doesn't leave the jar and then just kind of meander back to town. She very intentionally races back to the city and calls out to everyone she meets, come and see, this man has told me everything I've ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? I think it's worth noticing that the woman, she still has questions. Like many of us as baptized Christians, this woman is still puzzling through exactly who Jesus is and exactly what this encounter means for the rest of her life. But even with those questions, the woman is still unafraid to share her story with other people. The woman's encounter with Jesus, in fact, creates an opportunity for reconciliation as she races back to tell the very people she had been avoiding all about this man who has changed her life. Jesus doesn't reach out to us and transform us only for our own sakes. Jesus reaches out to us so that through us, the whole world may know the good news. Each of us has a story to tell. We each have encountered God in a life-changing way. Some of us have had those burning bush moments where everything becomes clear, and that's exciting. And a lot of us have experienced God in what seems mundane and commonplace. And yet, it is in those everyday things that God comes to us, reveals who God is, and invites us into a deeper relationship. Whatever it may be, we each have a story to tell, and we are called to share that story with others. The good news of God isn't something that we can pack up in a box and keep on a shelf. It is meant to be shared in the company of others. Now, the story of the Samaritan woman is an example of how we encounter Jesus Christ and are transformed by the gift of the knowledge and love of God. She is for us a model of our own discipleship, looking at what it means to spend quality time with God and then to go and tell and invite others to experience the same. As baptized Christians, we talk about how we are called to a cruciform life, a life that engages with God and engages with other people. We're often really good at that first part. It's easy to read scripture and to pray and spend that one-on-one -on -one time with God. It's just me and God. But dealing with other people? We need to work on that. But we cannot neglect that aspect of the baptized life. Remember what happens after the Samaritan woman goes and tells people about her encounter. Later in the story, we read that many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And many more believed because of Jesus' word. They say to the woman that it's no longer because of you that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Because this woman was willing to pay attention to what the living water was stirring up in her, because she was willing to go and share that story with others, how many more people came to know Christ? Would that it would be so with us. I have to wonder, friends, what new life is the living water stirring up in you? Are you willing to let that spirit-filled water overflow its banks and spill out of your heart for the sake of the good news of Jesus Christ? It has been our custom during this season of Lent to pray together a prayer of confession each Sunday. I invite you to join me in this prayer as we spend that time with the God of mercy. We say together, Lord, you know who we are. You know everything we have done. We thirst for things that will never satisfy us. We commit ourselves to things that will never last. We worship things that will never bring salvation. 
Still, you offer us the gift of living water. Still, you offer us the gift of eternal life. Forgive us, O Lord, and give us this living water so that we may never thirst again. Amen. Friends, know that you are forgiven, redeemed, and renewed. May the God of all grace fill you to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Amen.